right, what's up, y'all? Thanks for coming out. Great to see you. If you're a guest with us, I'm Jared. I have the joy of getting to be the senior pastor, pastor so a special welcome to you all, especially the uh, Grace family. Also, welcome to our campuses. You know, something I want to share is for years, we have been recording here at the Washingtonville, campuses, uh, Washingtonville campus, and then we'd send the recordings to our other campuses. And I'm excited to share this weekend because of the Let's Go Giving, and I hope you're giving to that. I hope you're a part of that. If not, I hope you'll jump on board. But because of that, and because of years of praying, right now, we are simulcasting live to all of our campuses. Yeah. Yeah. So I see you, Port Jervis. I see you, Warwick. Yeah, Warwick, Newburgh, Middletown, Port Jervis. Thank you all for joining us. It's a joy to be live now with you, and of course, right here at Grace Community Church, Washingtonville. We're in a series I'm excited about. I'm just going to jump right in. I came across a quote a while back that I loved. It was by G.K. Chesterton. He's one of my favorite writers from back in the day, authors, poets. He said, he said, I've always viewed life as if it were a story. And if it is a story, then there is a storyteller. And I completely agree. I believe that we are caught up in a story that's ultimately written and finding ourselves in the story by a storyteller. And where we find the story being revealed through the, through the storyteller, the grand story we find in Scripture. Matter of fact, if you just look at Scripture, you look at the Bible, you'll find in the first chapter of Genesis, in the beginning, God. Then there's this arc over the, the story of Scripture, even into the day, till the day that will come in the last chapter of Revelation, and they will reign forever and ever. And so the story is being told throughout, and we are caught up in that story, coming from, written through human beings, of course, from God's Holy Spirit. So as we get into this uh, series, I, I want to so there's a few things i got to share. One is, I don't know if you've noticed over the years, if you've been a part of Grace or Grace Family, I rarely use the words or the word the Bible. I say scriptures because the word Bible is not found in the Bible. We hear Jesus calling it scripture and the scriptures tell and the scriptures have foretold and so forth. So I call it the scriptures. But we're talking about the Bible. And the reason I haven't used the word the Bible is because the Bible can carry so much baggage with it. You hear the word the Bible. I'm thinking of back when I was not following Jesus and, and how I, when I'd hear the Bible, I'd think, oh boy, it's Bible thumper, uh, irrelevant, boring, uh, out, of, out of touch, ancient. I had all these thoughts about it. And so I think about many of you who come and you're new to church or you're not a believer and being sensitive to what you hear. But in this series, it's going to be a different approach. We are calling it, I am going to call it the Bible, because that's what we have today and what we're to call it. But the approach of the series is not to defend the Bible. That is not what I want to do, and to defend it or to give proofs one, two, three, that's going to convince you of how you can trust the Bible, how you can trust the books that are actually in the Bible. I wrestle with that too. How do we know this is the really real word of God? Is it truly spoken from God? There, there are these books, but what about other books? Shouldn't they be in here? How do we know we have the right books? Who really decided about the books? All kinds of questions. I have been there, but we're not going to do that in this series. But where I provide it for you is right here at this link, graceoc.com slash Bible Bootcamp. So if you want to hear me defending the Bible in a sense or giving kind of a long teaching about the Bible, you can go to this link. So in 2013, I held this teaching one night from started, starting at 6 o'clock, and we were going to go until we finished. Over 600 people showed up. We were blown away here at this campus. And I taught about the Bible from 6 o'clock at night to 1 o'clock in the morning. And we just took bathroom breaks here and there and kept going. Well, that entire recording is right there at the Bible Boot Camp uh, link. Also, there's the fill-in-the-blank outlines that are there with it. So you, in your own time, you can listen to it. You can fill in the blanks and hear about the Bible, how we got it, the books, how can we trust it's God's word to us, all kinds of things. So right there, all for you. Now, with that said, I do want to own how the Bible does bring up a lot of questions, and that it's very long, and it can be very boring for some. 
and it can awaken other kinds of questions. Even for me, there are things in here I have questions about. There are things in the Bible that disturb me, that's revealed to us here. But at the same time, I've recognized that God has chosen not to explain himself. God has chosen not to explain himself in a lot of ways in the way he, he dealt with nations and people back in that day. And even the writers through whom God spoke don't answer a lot of questions. It seems, some, seems sometimes they provoke more questions than answer them. But that's okay because God's inviting you to a story. He's inviting you to, to, to be caught up in a drama and tension and mystery and an adventure revealed throughout here in the scriptures. So I wonder if I was to pause and just say, what is your take on the Bible? As you walk into this room at all of our campuses, when you hear the word Bible, what enters your mind? What's your take on it? And I wonder if you might be in a place where you'd say, well, I don't, I don't even know where to start with the Bible. I don't even know where to read. Or you've probably said, I, you know, I've tried to read it. I don't get it. Pastor, you're paid to, to read the Bible for me. <laughs> you're paid to preach on it. I'm going to listen to you. Maybe that's it. Maybe you just think it's boring. Maybe you, you don't trust it. There's, how do you know it's true? And it seems like there might be some contradictions in there. And what do we do with that? I get it. I've been there. Or you may say, it just seems like a, a book full of rules that doesn't really apply to me. Or you may say it doesn't make sense. Or it's boring. Or you only look to it for certain things when you need it. I know for me, when I was growing up, I only liked to read the Bible, a few things in the Bible. My top two things to, that I love reading about were, were demons and the end times. Anybody? That's kind of, maybe it was just my weirdness, but that's what I, that's what interested me. <clears throat> and then as I got older, what interested me was more the verse of the day or motivational verses. So I was a ball player in college. I wasn't even following Jesus then, but I could always use some motivation from the Bible. So I would pick scriptures like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I'd put that on my mirror. And it was almost like a lucky rabbit's foot too. If I read the Bible, surely God's going to give me a good game tonight. Uh, maybe for you too. Maybe you're a verse a day person. Maybe it's a motivational verse. Or maybe you only go to the Bible when you're when you're uh, afraid or you're worried or you're anxious. There's some great scriptures in there on that. And so maybe that's an approach. It's the, or maybe you do the daily devotional where it gives you one verse and then there's a long story behind it. Well, what I want to bring to you is to, to, for us to step our game up because if you're not reading the story of God, the Bible, and in, 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 in following it, reading it in chunks, then you're missing out on what God is speaking dealing with the complex questions of life. The scriptures, through God's word, ask questions that you're not asking about you. And you're not going to get that with a motivational verse. You're not going to get that with just coming to hear Pastor Jared preach. you got to read it for yourself because it's asking questions that you're not going deep enough in your life to even ask. And it's, it's, it's even answering questions that you probably have but really haven't gotten your mind around. Complex questions that we'll talk about here in a little while. If we think of Scripture as well, we think of it as not just going to it and seeing a cause for the universe, but going to meet the creator of the universe. It's approaching Scripture, not looking for a proof of why you can trust it or the proof of why the universe exists. You go to meet God and what it means to come home to him what it means to have relationship to him and how he speaks and how people respond to him. Again, as I mentioned, it also deals with complex questions and big questions of life that we yearn to have answers for. It made me think of this interview with a comedian and a late night talk show host years ago. I won't give their names, but it was an interesting interview. And here's the comedian bantering back and forth with uh, this uh, late night talk show host kind of around the big questions of life. And here's his take on it. He said, you know, as human beings, we're just unable to sit there. We're unable just to sit there because underneath everything in your life, there's that thing, that empty, forever empty. That knowing that it's all for nothing and that you're all alone and sometimes in your car, not watching anything and you're just sitting there, you start going, oh no, here comes that I am alone. So what do we do? We open up social media or we turn the music louder. And I'm thinking, this guy's a comedian? I'm depressed just listening to this. Here's what he goes on to say. That's why we text and drive. He says, I look around and pretty much 100% of the people driving are texting. 
we're killing each other with our cars because people are willing to risk taking a life and ruining their own because they don't want to be alone for a second because it's so hard. You know what this is? This is God's megaphone to you that you are not alone. And there's a reason you are here. There is a purpose for which you are made. God has a specific purpose for you attached to your name. There's a reason you are here, a cosmic reason God has at work for you. And Scripture unveils that in mystery, in tension, as you read to find yourself in the story. So what do we have with Scripture? Let me give a little bit of practical thoughts. First of all, the Bible is... Uh, not just a book. It's actually, a, this is a library. It's a library of books. It's 66 books, in fact, written by different authors over a period of about 1,000 years, and it's telling one story, one grand epic story, which is miraculous, that it can tell one story and be unified, 66 books over all these years. And we find in Scripture how we got Scripture. Jesus was high on Scripture. Jesus was high on Scripture so much that he was quoting Scripture as he was dying on the cross. So we see that Scripture comes, the Bible comes, through God speaking through the personalities of men. In other words, the writers of Scripture weren't hanging out in their office one day writing, and all of a sudden they went into a trance and just started writing out what God told them to. No, it was in the rhythm of life and mess and relationships and regret and failure that they wrote. God spoke through their personalities and wrote out what he would have for us. We find this in the New Testament as well. And I know that can be hard to get. It can be hard to get your mind around. I do deal with that at that Bible Boot Camp link. But then I would ask the question of, how else would you see God speaking to us then? Because he had it written down for us. Would it be more convincing that God would speak to us being uh, through a dove from heaven that would take a parchment of scripture in its talons and fly down to Jerusalem and drop it off and fly away? I mean, is that con more convincing? Because that's what I ask myself in the days of my doubting about truth and scripture and the Bible. Those are the kind of questions I would ask. What would truly convince me? And that's when I go, nothing would convince me. Because I'm looking for proof. And then it reminds me of why proof doesn't, isn't going to get you there. And here's my experience. Psalm 119, the longest psalm, in, the longest psalm in the Psalms, longest chapter of the Bible, strictly deals with the Bible, deals with Scripture. And the psalmist says in Psalm 119, psalm 119 verse 71, it was good that I suffered, that I might learn your decrees. What did he say? He's saying, it was good that I suffered so that I would trust and approach your word with humility. Meaning, there could be this sense of he went to it to argue with it. He went through it to poke holes in it, but then he suffered. And it humbled him to the fact he came now to the scriptures hungry, thirsty, looking for answers, looking and waiting and surrendered to God. That's what got me to the scriptures. And maybe that's what it will take for you. Maybe that's, what it's, maybe that's how you got there. But that's why we would call it good, because in the scriptures, Moses says, the word of God is your life, and it is my life. We see in scripture there's stories, there's poems, there's teachings, exploring, again, the big complex questions of life. I'll talk about that, about that in just a moment. And these are, these are, this is God speaking through the personalities of human that he, humans that he wanted this written down. So we begin with Genesis chapter 1, God speaking. In the beginning, God spoke, God said. It was written down through Moses and other prophets throughout the Old Testament, such as Jeremiah. You see this refrain of the word of the Lord says. You find it being recorded down. You find in the New Testament that the Holy Spirit said, and you find these authors writing it down, God speaking through their personality. Then you find God speaking through a person the word of God coming who became flesh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus himself, the living scriptures, carrying the truth of scripture from the Old Testament in himself, going to the cross, quoting scripture, looking at scripture, saying the scriptures point to me, all about Jesus. Then you get to Revelation toward the last chapter and Jesus looks at the apostle John writing these things down. And Jesus says to John, write this down, write this down. I can imagine John going, okay, what do you mean write down? Jesus said, write this down. 
down. The day is coming that there will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears, for God will wipe every tear away. Death will be over. Old things gone, all things new. Hey, John, write that down. Aren't you glad John wrote that down? Aren't you glad of, of all the things God has recorded in Scripture for us to see? A grand story unfolding and where it ultimately points us. What we find in Scripture are are, are three three, uh, approaches. We find stories, we find poetry, and we find teachings of what's called discourse or prose. Let me explain it in a way that would help us. I'm really leaning into, in this series, uh, a scholar by the name of Dr. Tim Mackey, who, who does a, what's called a, the Bible Project and also a podcast called My Strange Bible and just really following their lead in this series, powerful what, they te- what he teaches. So for example, again, stories, poetry, and the teaching. So take stories. So a- almost over, uh, uh, over half of the Bible is stories. And this is what's miraculous about it. It's telling the same story. So think of, and this is fiction, but think of like the Harry Potter series or or a Lord of the Rings, there's first book, second book, third book, and it's a continuation of the story. Welcome to the story of God in Scripture, the true story. Authors, many different authors over 1,000 years telling a story in each book from Genesis to Revelation. It's telling and continuing the story of God. So stories, also poetry. One out of every three pages of the Bible is poetry, and we know poetry. If you go back to your Junior high days, remember uh, Walt Whitman was a poet. Uh, Mark, we've heard of Mark Twain, or my favorite poet, Johnny Cash. Anybody, Johnny Cash fan? Johnny Cash, the poet, singer. You know, we got first and second Peter, you got first and second Johnny Cash, all right? But, you know, the poetry in Scripture was to be sung. So I think of Johnny Cash, the poet, he sings. A lot of Scripture is to be sung, and it's poetry. So why am I taking a few minutes to talk about this? Because it might, you got to remember, and as, as we grow in this together over the next few weeks, and how this applies to our life on Monday morning, is you got to understand what you're reading when you're reading it, and, and time will help this. you got to understand, well, this is a story I'm reading, or no, this is a teaching I'm reading, or no, this is poetry I'm reading. Because if you're reading something that's poetry and thinking it's teaching, you're going to see contradictions because it's poetry. So, for example, let me throw one out there. We all know, or we'll all say, wow, that was an amazing sunrise, or that was an amazing sunset. But we've already known by science, again, in junior high, that the sun does not rise, does it? The sun does not set. It's the earth turning, which reveals the sun to us. So we would read Scripture and go, ah, ah, the Scripture is unscience because it's saying the sun rises and the sun sets. No, no, it's it's poetry. Just like us, nobody in here is going to say, or... For example, we would say to the sunset, oh, that is an amazing sunset. No one would ever go, oh, that's an amazing earth rotation. (laughs) Because it's poetry. Same with scripture. So you got stories, you have poetry, you have teachings. Think TED Talks. You have ancient TED Talks that's recorded in scripture or or letters or sermons. 1 John, letter of 1 John, the New Testament. is actually a sermon to God's people as John was the pastor over them in that day. And we're to take Scripture and read it for life. Scripture's never meant to be read, that you pick it up and you read, kind of put your finger on a section and read that section, or read a motivational first. I only read on topics, like I'm worried, so I'm going to find all the Scriptures on worry. All that's help, helpful. I'm not knocking it. The verse of the day that you read, the daily Bible verse, Daily Bread is the little book I grew up reading where it's one verse and a whole lot of story You're just getting a whole lot of somebody's insights. You're not getting the words of God. Because if you're just reading little bits of it and you're not reading it over life and seeing yourself in it, you're not going to be confronted with the big questions you should be asking that you don't know to ask. You're not going to be dealing with complex issues that, that, are, that are lurking within you that you, you haven't even understood how to get to, but yet God's Word can bring it out and provide direction on it. Psalm chapter 1 gives us an insight of how we are to read Scripture for life. It talks about the one who can be like a tree planted by the streams of water in, in the, in the, like in a desert in a drought, but yet can still bear fruit. Who is that person? It says, one, the one who meditates on God's word day and night, who meditates on his law, who meditates on the scripture. Meditating literally means to mutter. Day and night means for life. 
Literally, we are to read Scripture so much over and over again for life, never tiring of it. And we never will if you understand the tension in it and the drama in it and the mystery of it and that it's God speaking. It'll never get old if you continue to approach it that way. And, you get, and then you can get to it, and as you read it more and more, it's supposed to have a, such a place in us that as you read it, it reads you. And then throughout the day, we're to mutter it to ourselves. That's the kind of gravity it should have in us. Again, if this is new to you, keep coming back as we step more and more into what this means for our lives. I don't think I have to argue or convince you that throughout history, this has been the most influential book or book of books throughout history. I think I could put God's weight behind that or show us God's weight behind that. When we see in Psalm 138, chapter 138, verse 2, God speaks to the psalmist and says, I have exalted above all things my name and my word. That is a that is quite the, the declaration. God says, above all things, I've exalted my name, my word. What's God's name ultimately that he points to in the New Testament in Philippians? The name that is above all names, the name of Jesus. So he says, above all things, I've exalted the, the name of my son, Jesus Christ. And I've exalted my word, the scriptures, what we hold today as the Bible, the word of God. So God's weight is behind it. Also, we see in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, God, through the prophet, says, the grass will wither and the flowers will fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Another reason I think, though, the Bible is one of the most influential books in history is it explores the big questions of life. I know that's what it's meant for me. Such as, who am I? Who am I? Why am I here? What's my purpose? What's most important in life? How should I live my life? Who should be most important in my life? I think of Mark Twain. I mentioned him earlier. Listen to this quote. I have it written here. He says, the two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. Because many of us think the reason we're born is the work we do or the children we raise. But at the end of the day, you know it's all soap bubbles. It gives you meaning for a moment, and then when you try to claim it to satisfy you, gone. Nothing truly gets to the bottom of who you are. But God shows us how to get to that place of purpose and meaning and, and joy, ultimate joy, not just happiness based on circumstances. It's found in the story of God and the stories of God, God dealing with people, people dealing and responding with, to God. So this is not just a book to read. One rabbi said, if you approach the Bible like a book to read, you're going to get silence. It's just going to be a book. But he says, if you approach it as if it's a spiritual power, you're going to hear God's voice. It makes sense because the Hebrew writer in the New Testament says, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating through the joints and marrow, dividing uh, the heart and the mind and, and judging the thoughts and the attitudes of your heart. The scripture does that, not the bestseller. The story of God. We have so much in common with people in Scripture, too. If you think Scripture's irrelevant or it's a bunch of rules, listen to this. People in Scripture experience these kinds of things. See if you find yourself here. Anxiety, worry, fear, even moments of happiness. In Scripture, you find cries of why. You ever, you ever been worried? You ever been in a dark place asking God Why? You ever been in a place where you pray and you feel like everything you pray, God does the opposite of what you're praying for? Welcome to the story of God. Welcome to the people of Scripture. You find relationship fallout. You find failure. You find regret. You find second chances. You find successful people who look at their wealth and go, it's meaningless. It's meaningless. It's all soap bubbles. It doesn't satisfy. You find wrestling with this empty, forever empty, this I'm aloneness. You find need for validation, the longing to be known yet not rejected, the longing not to pre perform, to earn somebody's love, to be loved just as you are. It's all here. You find yourself here when you open your heart to it. Welcome to the story of God. And to help you and I find our place in the story, let me land our time by giving us a walk through the grand story of God. So the, the, our, our approach in this series 
is today's the launch, and then I have it broken down in a segment, many, many series, many part series throughout. Or next week when you come back, I'm going to unpack the book of Genesis. And the following week, which you're coming back, you're coming back. Yes, the following week, we're going to talk about Exodus. And the following week, we're going to talk about Leviticus. Anybody want to get into some Leviticus? And after that, into some Numbers and Deuteronomy. All the way to Revelation. So until 2021, you'll be coming back. I'm joking, I'm joking. (laughs) But we're going to deal with each book of the Bible and find your place in it. What does this mean for my marriage? What does this mean for my work? What does this mean if I'm single? We're going to take even Leviticus and see how this works how, how this story of God and our place in it works on Monday morning. So pray for me as I labor with that. And then what we'll do is we'll unpack it. Sometimes I'll hit time out and say, hey, God has another message for us this weekend. We're going to take a time out in our series, this message. Or we'll take a time out. Our lead pastors may preach a series. Or I'll take a time out and I'll do a different series. But this will be a series we keep coming back to over time to see God's story and our place in it. So just to give you a snapshot of God's ultimate story from Genesis to Revelation, we call it the grand story, is found in God's creation, our rebellion, our rescue, and then with God, our reign. Creation, rebellion, rescue, reign. First of all, creation. Creation begins the story where we are introduced to God. We meet God in Genesis, and his beautiful mind, and who he is, and he speaks and stuff comes out of nothing, and he takes chaos. He brings order to it. He takes darkness and makes it beautiful. And then he creates man and woman, Adam and Eve. And he's created them just a little less than himself for them to rule creation on God's behalf, to participate with him, to be partners almost in a sense with him to rule his creation. And there we meet trees. We meet a certain tree. It's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We don't know what kind of tree it is. I don't know if it's an orange tree. I don't know if it's an apple tree, but it's a tree. But God's said, you know, the tree is also represented by a fruit. What kind of fruit? We don't know. God has deemed it. That's not important for us to know. The important thing to know is there's this tree and a fruit, and it represents the knowledge of good and evil. And now we're left in this moment, this tension of Adam and Eve. Are they going to trust God's knowledge of good and evil, or are they going to seize power from God and determine good and evil for themselves? Anybody find yourself in the story yet? You're going to do what God says? You're going to do what you want to do? You're going to listen to what God's word says is true, or you're going to live out what you desire. We're in the same story. It's creation. And then what happens? Rebellion. Rebellion. So there's this serpent that shows up, this snake that represents this dark figure, and it speaks. I don't get it. I don't know. I run from snakes. Adam and Eve didn't run from the snake. Actually, they had a conversation with the snake. I don't have conversations with animals. They just acted like it was no big deal. They just kind of hung out and talked about things. I don't know. Why, why is that? How, I don't know. God chose not to explain this to us. But we see it's happening. And the serpent represents an evil being. And the evil being says, did God really say? Did God really say, don't take part of the knowledge of good and evil? What he just said to Adam and Eve is, God's holding back on you. God's a killjoy. God's holding back on your pleasure and your happiness. Take the fruit, become like God, you'll be free, and you'll be truly happy, and you can fulfill all your desires from God, outside of God. Sound familiar? You can find any book on Amazon that will give you the interpretation you're looking for on the Bible. Doesn't matter what hundreds of years have said. If we have a certain desire in our lives that we want to play out and we want some validation for it, we'll search Amazon to find the author that says what we want to hear. And we'll go, there it is. That's the interpretation. Because did God really say? Anybody find yourself in that story? Anybody know what God's telling you to do? You know there's a conviction. Here's what God's calling me to do or what to break or what to stop. But you decide you're going to keep going anyway. Now, welcome to the story of God. This is Adam and Eve. We find ourselves in the story. So what do they do? They take the fruit and they eat of it. They decide they want to define good and evil on their own. And they took of the fruit and what they thought would bring freedom brought slavery. What they thought would bring happiness brought devastation. Everything fractured. Everything broke. They broke. Bodies broke. Our minds are broke. The universe is broke. That's why there's cancer. That's why there's mental illness. That's where there's tsunamis and earthquakes because everything is broken. Anybody find yourself in this story? Anybody done what you wanted to do and in the end it broke a lot of stuff? Anybody know somebody that did what they want to do and it broke you? 
Welcome to the story of God. So you're not going to find this reality, this deep, like, ugh, in your life if you're reading a motivational verse a day. You've got to get in the grit of the story and what it's really saying about you and me. So there's devastation, but God in his love refuses to give up on humanity. So we meet Moses, and we meet, or we meet Noah, and then we meet no Moses, and then we meet Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah are huge to this story. We're going to meet them again next week. Then we meet King David, and we think God is going to bring the people back to himself, and he's going to create a nation called Israel, that Israel is going to be perfect as if God, like God created it. But we find there are a bunch of dumpster fires, y'all. The kings are dumpster fires. Abraham and Sarah, through which the lineage would come, through the hope of the world, and the blessing of all nations. Are you kidding me? Abraham slept with his servant girl, and Sarah told him to. None of us are really that messed up. You get King David, a man after God's own heart, he committed adultery and had her husband murdered. That's worse than we are. Yet God left that in there for you and me, saying even even how people are determined to self-destruct, And people are determined to do it their way and create dumpster fires in their lives. God says, I'm still coming after you. Anybody find yourself in that story? You ever created a dumpster fire in your life? You ever had someone create a dumpster fire in your life? Welcome to the story of God. It's the same. We find ourselves right here in the scripture. So Abraham and Sarah fell. King David fails. Israel fails. Everybody's failing. But God continues to pursue a people. He sends prophets and he says, come back, come back home. Tells Israel, come back home. He says to the, to the kings, come back to me, come back to me. And they refuse. They go back for a little while and then they turn around. Does that remind you of anyone? Can it remind you of you? Reminds you of me? You ever sense God maybe under the sound of my voice saying, come home, come home, come home. Do you go home? Do you go home for a little while and then go back to your own ways? We find it right here. But God continues to pursue even in the rebellion. And then there's this promise by the prophets that says there is someone who is going to come, who's going to cover over this failure and regret and sin, who's going to redeem us, who's going to transform us and change us for glory. There's one to come. And there's that promise. Then we get to Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament. Silence. The promises hang for 400 years. You ever feel like God's just silent in your life? And you're waiting and you're waiting for God to do something instead of doing the opposite of what you're praying for. You're just waiting for him to do what you're hoping for. Anybody ever been there? You just think God's quiet and you're forgotten? Welcome to the story of God. You're in the story. We're in the story together. But God doesn't give up and God may seem silent for a while. But then he speaks. And the word was spoken and the word became flesh and dwelled among us. We so could not get it right. We failed at every turn that God came himself for you and for me through Jesus, through the line of Abraham and Sarah, through the line of King David, no matter how that was determined by them in a way to self-destruct, God held it all together, and here comes Jesus of Nazareth. And then Jesus shows up, and he continues the story of Genesis through Malachi right into his life. And he says over and over again, the scriptures bear witness about me. And then Jesus' life continues the story of the perfect life that God created, who he called David to be and Israel to be and Abraham. Jesus lived out this perfect life. He came and he showed what true power is, true power being loving enemies, your enemies, true power being forgiving those who you shouldn't forgive. And then Jesus did the unthinkable. He comes and he takes on all the failures and sin and evil of history. He resists it and doesn't give in to it like Abraham and David and Israel. He resists it and then he conquers it by going to another tree. And it is the tree of the cross where he hung there quoting scripture and praying in his last breath, dying for you and me. On the third day, he's risen from the grave, showing he defeats sin and death and evil, resurrected. And one of my favorite poets put it this way, the resurrection of Jesus is laughter freed forever and ever. 
And so in the resurrection, Jesus reveals himself, his disciples see him, that over 500 people see him alive, then he ascends to be with the Father, and all these witnesses begin telling other people, and they begin telling other people, and these groups of people start forming in these villages and cities and towns. These little groups of people become bigger, pe- bigger groups. These groups are called the church. And as they get together in the church, they don't get along at all. They're selfish, they're sinful, they grumble, they complain, they're persecuted. Following Jesus is really tough. Getting along with other people in that church is hard. So then the pastors start stepping up. The leaders of the church, they start writing letters and preaching sermons saying, please don't Quit relationships. You are now brothers and sisters in Christ. Be kind to one another. Treat each other tenderly. Be patient with one another. Reconcile with each other. Then they would write letters and preach sermons to hang in there if you're going through a hard, dark time. Hang in there. Watch the faithfulness of God throughout history. He's got you. Hang in there if you're being persecuted by your faith. He's with you. He's got you. Stay strong. And then, always in their writings was this, and oh, by the way, he's coming for you again. Creation, rebellion, the rescue through Jesus, and then rain. Now we meet the final tree. It's called the tree of life in Revelation. The tree of life represents that God has made the way through Christ and opened the door for you to run to him, to be with him forever. This is where the scriptures culminate in the moment of saying, and we shall reign forever and ever. Where everything sad becomes untrue, where all things wrong are made right, where Jesus said, write this down, it's where we're with God. And as we are with God, we do what failed in Genesis. We participate with God in ruling in his love and power. We're, we're participants, we're co-rulers, we're, we're partners with him forever in pure laughter freed for all eternity. We shall reign forever and ever. Welcome to the story of God. Now, what do you do with this when you leave today? Here's what I'll give you a thought. This is what the Lord says, says the prophet. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. How many of you have determined to walk in your own path? Aren't you exhausted? If you're like me, you're you're always looking for the new. I I love new. I love new books. I love new books on marriage. I love new books on church. I love new books on leadership. I love new, 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 new. I love new gadgets. I love new updates on my iPhone. I love the new. But you know what I tend to realize about the new? It exhausts me. It's exhausting. And it never truly gets gets me going in a way that feels really, really right. So what I'm compelled to do to love you and shepherd you over the next while is join me and let's go back to the ancient paths. Let's go back to the ancient stories. Not look for new interpretations, not look for new, new, but go, go to what's been influential throughout history. What does that look like? It's to stand at the crossroads and look. It's to unplug. It's to stop. It's to get alone and be with Scripture and read and ponder and mutter. Read it for life. Read it so it can read you. The ancient past. We can be, you can begin this week. Here you go. There are Bibles in the back of the seats at all of our campuses. If you don't own a Bible, take that Bible home with you or whatever. If you have a Bible on your phone, this week you can read Genesis. We're going to be in Genesis next week. But I will say Genesis is 50 chapters. But you know what? You binge watch Netflix, all right? You can binge read Genesis. (laughs) All right? So stand at the crossroads and look. Go to the ancient story, the ancient past. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. Meaning, God, where's my place in the story? What are the big complex questions you're revealing about me right now? Where's the answers or where's the mystery? Just, I want you. I'm coming home. And you will find rest for your souls. The story of God, Genesis next week. I hope you'll come back. Let's pray. 
Lord, thank you for everyone who's joined us across Orange County at our campuses. Warwick, Middletown, Newburgh, Port Jervis, and right here in our Washingtonville location. Thank you for everyone who is here. Everybody walks in here with a different story, unique pain, doubts, struggles. And Lord, my plea and my prayer is that we would begin to find ourselves and find our hope and our, even our answers or even just our peace when the answers aren't there in the ancient paths, in the ancient story, by coming home to you, the storyteller. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen.